morning. The first case to come before the court this morning is Henry C.W. and B.W. Uh, as you're aware, both parties will have 15 minutes in which to present their case. The appellant may retain up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you're the appellant, when you come up to the podium, let me know I'm keeping track of the clock and we'll keep your price of the passage of time. We are being visually and audibly recorded to be posted online, so please try to remain behind the podium as much as possible. I have to argue here. You do? Yeah, you do. I think we've made an adjustment for that, so you're, you're, you're fine. Attorney Rosenbaum. We have read your briefs and we're ready to proceed when you are. I'm ready and I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Please, the court, my name is Jonathan Rosenbaum. It's my privilege to appear before you on behalf of Lindsay Everhart. I would like to first respectfully suggest to you that the November 1st, 2011 entry that gave rise to all of these appeals and all of this litigation is void for lack of jurisdiction. And I base that upon Henry Gibson, 61 Ohio State 3rd, 168. And Gibson, a grandparent, filed a, a complaint for visitation, but he did so under 3109.05 instead of 3109.11 or 12, which is the grandparent's visitation statute. I believe the Supreme Court of Ohio made it very clear that a juvenile court has limited jurisdiction and that there is no jurisdiction to proceed under the 05 uh, for grandparent's visitation. Ohio Revised Code Section 3109.11 11 and 12 require that a complaint which must be verified be filed to see grandparents' visitation. That was never done in this case. As a result of that, I submit to you that the that entry, even though 3 of 2000, uh, November 1st, 2011, is void and it, it should be vacated by this court and all of these appeals dismissed, and, and including the writ of prohibition. And I, I respectfully say all of them. Uh, the grandparents in this case, the Sherwood's attempt to distinguish Gibson by saying that since it filed a complaint for custody under the proper number, that it had the authority to approve a settlement which included grandparents' visitation. That's the crux of his brief. He makes it on page 14 of his merit brief. But as Gibson pointed out, the Supreme Court Gibson pointed out, Visitation and custody are related but distinct legal concepts. The grant of jurisdiction for one is not the grant of jurisdiction for the other. If you accept the grandparents' interpretation of Gibson, then you essentially nullified the statutory requirements enacted by the Ohio legislature that requires a complaint to be filed to invoke the jurisdiction of it. Of a limited juvenile court jurisdiction to consider grandparents' visitation. And as we, we all know, statutes are to be construed in light of each other and to be given full force and effect if possible. And the only way to do that in this case would be to, to find that Gibson stands for the proposition that he must file a separate complaint for grandparents' visitation, which was not done in this case. It's axiomatic that if an order is void, it can't be appealed. Uh, this court has the authority to vacate it and dismiss the appeal. I uh, rely on Fifth Third Mortgage versus Rankin, uh, 20, 2012 Ohio, 2804, paragraph 9. I also argue to the court that the trial court did not give grandmother, I'm sorry, mother's wishes the appropriate weight. As we all know, it's a fundamental constitutional right to raise your parents as you see fit if you're a suitable parent, and the court is bound to give the appropriate weight to those wishes uh, in, in all proceedings. In this case, the trial court professed to do so, but failed. It completely misinterpreted mother's wishes when it held that she really didn't want a visitation to be actually terminated, even though she testified that she did, even though she filed a motion to terminate visitation. It misconstrues uh, one portion of the record and, and substitutes grandparents for children uh, by using the pronoun them when clearly uh, the term implies it refers to the children. The mother wanted the, grand, the children to have a normal life. The normal is not the grandparents. Uh, the, the court also recognized the mother wanted and testified that she wanted the uh, temporary order to continue. The temporary order included no overnight visitation whatsoever, yet he imposed overnight visitation even though she said she wanted no visitation until her 
children to be protected. Uh, there's little doubt in this case that the grandmother had some serious mental issues. The court so found, as I will argue later. In any event, the court cannot assign the proper weight to a parent's wishes and completely misinterprets and misunderstands them. Now, I respectfully argue also that it was contrary to the best interests of these children if you find jurisdiction to continue visitation with the grandmother. This is especially so when the court specifically found that grandmother's actions pose a risk to the mental and emotional health of the minor children. Their conduct of weighing them naked, recording them, using investigators to follow them slash mother, discussing the litigation with them, examining their excrement, and questioning them about activities is having a detrimental effect upon their mental, emotional health and safety. The court went on to find the children had become collateral damage in grandmother's war with mother. The court finds the grandmother's conduct to be adverse to the best interest of the children. How it can be in the best interest of the children to continue overnight visitation with a person under these circumstances, I think is clearly an abuse of discretion and flies in the face of common sense. I respectfully submit that the court might have done so because the court was upset that grandmother or that mother uh, somehow prepared the children for the in-camera oral argument. The in-camera oral argument statute clearly limits the trial court to finding out and ascertaining what the wishes of the children are regarding where they want to live. The court concluded in this case because of mother's interference, whether that be real or not, that he could not rely on the children's uh, expression of what their wishes were. The inquiry should have ended then, but instead the court went on to cross-examine these children, or examine the children, or interview them, whatever word you choose to apply. Uh, we say for an hour and a half in the brief, uh, grandmother says there's no record of how long that lasted, in the or no mention in the record of that. However, the transcripts are available, and this court can clearly see that this was extensive and probably did last an hour and a half for one child and half an hour for the other. But in any event, the court went on to examine them about uh, their homeschooling and other things and concludes that the, even the, well beyond the grant that the statute gives them for the in-camera uh, interview, that the mother made them Manchurian candidates. And, and it appears that he made good on his threat that if anybody, when he warned them that there would be negative consequences for so doing, when he had continued grandparents' visitation under the circumstances where he found it would be grandparents' conduct to be harmful to the children. And finally, I would like to argue that the trial court obviously did not understand the rule about when objections can be filed. Clearly, objections can be filed by uh, a party within 10 days of an another, the opposite party filing objections. That was done in this case. Despite that, the trial court ruled that mother's objections were untimely, clearly an error contrary to law. It also ruled that her motion for attorney's fees for frivolous conduct, frivolous conduct was untimely. It did so because, and it's all that it had to do so, was on 30 days of the October 14, 2016 ruling. However, litigation was pending for to the GALTs. The statute 2923.51 clearly permits mother to file within 30 days of the final entry. I respectfully submit that in this case, the final entry did not occur until June when the trial court resolved all the issues regarding GAL fees. Thank you. Thank you. You'll have five minutes left for rebuttal, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. So, may it please the Court, my name is Brent English. I represent <coughs> the appellees and cross appellants, Melva and Scott Sherwood. The first issue that's been raised in Lindsay Eberhardt's appeal is whether or not the Court had jurisdiction to consider a motion that she filed and which was adjudicated to a conclusion on October 14, 2016. We respectfully submit to the Court, and we have briefed this issue extensively that the court unquestionably had jurisdiction and that Mr. Rosenbaum's contentions are not warranted as a matter of law. 
Specifically, the facts in this case show that in 2010, Melba and Scott Sherwood, who are the uh, paternal grandparents of these two children, CW and BW, filed a motion for legal custody of the children. It was actually an emergency motion for legal custody of the children, which was granted by the court. Over a period of time, that uh, custody issue was ultimately resolved. But in the meantime, contrary to what Mr. Uh, Rosenbaum argued, the Sherwoods also filed a separate motion for grandparent visitation. I do not see in the statute any magical incantation that you have to dub that motion a quote complaint uh, in order for it to be a valid motion. Indeed, since the case was pending, Juvenile Rule 19 says that any further relief that you seek during the pendency of the case shall be by motion. That's exactly what happened in this case. This issue of alleged lack of jurisdiction was not raised in the trial court, and ultimately that matter was resolved with an agreement. There is an agreed judgment entry that's part of the record, which shows that the uh, paternal grandparents, Melba and Scott Sherwood, would have grandparent visitation. <coughs> Subsequent to that, in 2014, after the unfortunate death of Andrew Weaver, who is Melba Sherwood's son, and who was, at the time of his death, Lindsay Everhart's husband, there was a motion, a second motion, for legal custody of these children filed by Melba and Scott Sherwood based on new facts that had arisen. There is no dispute that in order for the Sherwoods or any grandparent for that matter to have legal custody or any third party to have legal custody of a child, it is necessary to demonstrate parental unsuitability. No question about that. Uh, that is the holding of in re paralysis. It continues to uh, uh, apply. Uh, we don't pretend otherwise. Nevertheless, when that motion was filed, in response to which Lindsay Everhart filed a motion to limit or terminate grandparent visitation. As the record will show, that matter was litigated somewhat extensively, both uh, actually the matter of legal custody was litigated somewhat extensively, and ultimately the Sherwoods withdrew without prejudice uh, their motion for legal custody, and the matter proceeded to hearing on only Lindsay Everhart's motion to reduce or terminate grandparent visitation. That's the matter that was in front of the trial judge, Judge uh, Janik, in September of 2000 and, uh, 2016. Uh, after a five-day hearing at which extensive evidence was produced, for which you have a transcript and a very clear summary, from, at least from our standpoint, in our appellate brief, the judge made a determination that it was uh, that Lindsay Everhart had not maintained the issues on her part and that it was not in the children's best interest to terminate their visitation with their paternal grandparents who had played a major role in these children's lives. I concede that the court was somewhat critical of certain things that the grandparents had done, allegedly, although uh, it reached the ultimate conclusion weighing all the evidence that it was nevertheless in the best interest of these children to continue with grandparent visitation and continue the very order that had been agreed to in November of 2011. From that, Lindsay Everhart has appealed, contending first that there's no jurisdiction, which I've addressed, and secondly, that the trial court abused its discretion. I would respectfully submit that there is no evidence in this record to suggest the trial court used the improper legal standard or that he, he in this case a man, did not properly consider all the evidence that was adduced in this case. I, I don't presume to know what happened during the in-camera interviews uh, with the children. The court certainly had authority to conduct them. The court did, in fact, conduct them. And that record is available to the court. It is not available to either of the parties. I don't know the duration of the interviews. I don't know the content of the interviews. And so therefore, I will not speculate, unlike my worthy opponent. Uh, in any event, we respectfully submit that uh, the trial court did not abuse its discretion. That's a very high legal standard that this court would have to find. That it was arbitrary, capricious, there was no support for it, or an improper legal standard was applied. 
and none of that exists in this record. So let me turn to the cross appeal, if I may, for a moment. There are there's a cross appeal that was filed by Melba and Scott Sherwood relating to guardian ad litem fees that were assessed against them in favor of the former guardian ad litem, a lawyer named James Barilla. This is one of the more difficult situations that I've encountered in my extensive years of practice. Uh, I have never seen a situation where a guardian ad litem developed a relationship with one of the parties, failed to disclose the relationship, and then surreptitiously sought fees from the other party without ever disclosing this. That is what happened in this case. After Mr. Mr. Barilla was an advocate in every way for Lindsay Everhart, we filed a motion to disqualify him because there was zero objectivity demonstrated by him throughout his involvement in this case. We knew there was something wrong. We just couldn't put our finger entirely on it. Ultimately, during the pendency of the motion for legal custody, I filed a motion to disqualify him on the grounds that he was clearly not complying with juvenile or excuse me, Superintendent's Rule 48, applicable to guardians ad litem, that he had demonstrated a remarkable bias in favor of Lindsay Everhart and a serious prejudice against my clients. Mr. Barilla filed a brief in which he contended that that did not happen, that he was objective and there was no basis to disqualify him, and the court regrettably, without conducting a hearing, denied the motion to, uh, to, to disqualify Mr. Barilla. What the record now shows, remarkably, is that Mr. Barilla allegedly informed the trial court in a letter that he never served on me as counsel for Ms. Everhart, or excuse me, counsel for Melba and Scott Sherwood, nor did he serve it upon my co-counsel, John Haynes, at the time, nor did he serve it upon uh, Lindsay Everhart's lawyer, uh, contending that he was aligned, that was the word he used, I put that in quotes, aligned with Lindsay Everhart, and that he could not be objective. Well, had the trial court known that, it is a certainty that he would have been removed as the guardian ad litem in this case. That, that just cannot be disputed. Nevertheless, he came without telling anybody that he was aligned with Lindsay Everhart, not that it wasn't pretty obvious to me, uh, and testified on her behalf during this five-day hearing that the judge held on Lindsay Everhart's motion to terminate or disqualify or, or eliminate grandparent, terminate or modify, reduce grandparent visitation. Then the court decided that it was going to hold a hearing on guardian ad litem fees. And Mr. Verla submitted to the court, without an affidavit, a, a quote, final fee statement which totaled $17,600. And when you looked at this as a final fee statement, it was obvious something was wrong with this. And so I wanted to conduct an evidentiary hearing on these fees. At that point, I must confess, although I suspected it, I did not know that there was this improper relationship that had developed between the guardian ad litem and attorney at law and one of the parties in this case. The court impermissibly decided, and, and inexplicably from my standpoint, that it was only going to conduct an oral argument, that's what it called, on the, uh, on, on the matter of guardian ad litem fees and refused to permit any kind of an evidentiary hearing. It quashed a subpoena that was issued to Mr. Barilla and a notice of deposition that was issued to him to get, kind of get to the bottom of this, and it did not permit me to undertake any examination of Mr. Barilla or Ms. Everhart in relation to the matter of fees. And then, remarkably, it criticized me for laying out for the court what I suspected was going on here, which ultimately proved to be 100% accurate. Nevertheless, the, the magistrate for the court made a judgment and imposed guardian's fees, about 80% of which against Melba and Scott Sherwood, and the remainder against Lindsay Everhart, and the Sherwoods filed objections with the magistrate. They are pretty detailed. We obtained a transcript of that entire proceeding that took place on the oral argument, and we submitted supplemental objections. And Lindsay Everhart did file her own objections, 
although I strongly believe, in fact, I know for a certainty that these were written by Mr. Perillo, which is even more outrageous. Nevertheless, these objections did not challenge any factual finding. They did not challenge any legal finding. All they did was uh, complain about the trial court. Nevertheless, uh, the court held an oral argument on, uh, in early June on the objections, and on June 7, 2017, it overruled all the objections, and from, which, from that we appealed. We submit that, first of all, the court did not have any jurisdiction to impose any guardian fees at all, because this court had remanded to the trial court for a specific amount of time to consider the matter of guardian ad litem fees, and then and put on Lindsay Everhart the duty to inform the court if the court needed more time. She never did. And so at the time when the court ruled on these objections, uh, the trial court had no jurisdiction whatsoever. And when I raised this matter to the trial court, I was told that uh, my objection was so frivolous that uh, it could potentially be sanctionable. But I respectfully submit to the court that jurisdiction is what it is, and the trial court had no ability to issue that order in the first place. Nevertheless, it did. And we raise in our appeal the fact that due process requires under facts and circumstances such as we have here an evidentiary hearing of some kind. And we've laid out the case law. This court has never addressed the issue. I think it's high time that that issue be addressed in the Ninth Appellate District because uh, in this case we have a huge amount of guardian ad litem fees that are issued under highly questionable circumstances without a record whatsoever other than the oral argument where I'm telling the court if the evidence were to come out, I believe it would have shown X, Y, and Z, but I concede that's no record at all. Uh, there's, there's no way to, to produce a record when the court prohibits you from actually having a hearing. The court interpreted, the trial court interpreted its role to be meant just to consider the positions of the parties and not to take any evidence with respect to whether the guardian ad litem fees were reasonable, their amount, whether they were necessary, and whether they should be imposed on one party or another. It somewhat goes without saying that if there is a private, personal, intimate relationship between one of the parties and the guardian ad litem, that that is a highly relevant fact to whether or not any guardian fees should be awarded. Uh, but that's the issue. And I'll just point out to you that ultimately that issue came before the trial court. And there's appeals to come. Uh, they did file, but not yet heard by the court where Judge Janik ultimately decided a motion for relief from judgment and concluded that this conduct was in fact outrageous and awarded no guardian fees whatsoever and vacated his prior order. Uh, I know the court is concerned about whether or not there is, whether this appeal is moot. I would respectfully submit to the court that if this is one of those kinds of cases where it's capable of repetition, yet review is evaded by virtue of what we have in this circumstance. And ultimately, there is uh, the very real possibility that in the event that this court were to reverse Judge Janik with respect to the motion for relief from judgment, this very issue of guardian ad litem fees still remains very active. Uh, so uh, I do I respectfully submit that this appeal is not moot. Let me address very promptly within one minute the last appeal that's currently consolidated with us. And that's the appeal ending in 162, filed by Lindsay Everhart. Lindsay Everhart does not challenge the allocation of, of guardian fees to her in this appeal. In fact, she did not file a cross appeal from Judge Janet's decision on June 7th with respect to that matter. Instead, she claims that her objections were not properly heard. And to that, Mr. Rosenbaum is correct, except that I believe that it is entirely harmless error. She just submitted no objections with any merit whatsoever. She did not detail what she was complaining about. She did not ask the court for any specific relief other than just complaining about the trial court uh, not doing what it, uh, what it in fact did, or complaining about what the trial court did uh, on her motion for, to vacate or, or terminate uh, the grandparent visitation. So I would respectfully submit that that aspect of her appeal, while merit, is not subject to, uh, to reversal because it's harmless error. And then the second thing she contends is you, that... Excuse me, sir, but you are out of time. Okay. Can, can I ask one question? Sure. Okay. 
this on the issue of the timeliness of the filing of the motion for attorney's fees? On the issue of mom's motion for attorney's fees being found to be untimely? Can yes, you, sure. Can you speak to that? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> the Lindsay ever there, there was a judgment dismissing the legal custody motion, which is what her motion for frivolous, alleged frivolous conduct related to under 23, 2351. That motion was decided in August of 2000 and, uh, 2016 by virtue of, the, of our dismissal of that motion without prejudice. There is abundant case law that says that when you do that, that is the operative date when that motion entitlement to seek attorney's fees for alleged frivolous conduct begins. Alternatively, if that decision was, was from the October 14, 2016 order, that motion was still not done. The court properly held that, uh, and therefore, I, I respectfully submit you should uh, affirm that decision. Thank you, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Attorney Rosemont, you have just over five minutes. Thank you. I would like to say that it's more than ironic that the counsel opposite is complaining that Judge Janik did not afford them a hearing on uh, the, the GAL fees. I, I'm not going to condone what this trial court judge did in this case. I think it denied everybody proper hearings that, and, and just did whatever it wanted. However, I will say that Mr. Nair's analysis, Magistrate Nair's analysis in this case is more than detailed. And, supported by case law that he was familiar with the litigation and the work done uh, and that what he did was proper and that they were not entitled to a hearing. But more importantly, Mr. English has made great hay with the fact that later on my client and GAL Barilla developed a personal relationship. But no one has ever afforded them an opportunity to say when this started. I don't believe that this issue was proper before this court at this time. It's a subject of a later appeal, and you will see that it's argued that they should have been given an opportunity to say when this relationship started. To sit here and claim that um, Mr. Barilla was obviously biased at the beginning because of this relationship that existed then is putting the cart before the horse. Uh, Mr. Barilla did not, as soon as he learned from the child's therapist, and the record is clear on this, what this grandmother was up to when weighing these children, examining their experiment in waging this vendetta against my client because she blamed mother for the fact that her son overdosed and she didn't save him is, is outrageous. But, and, and it clearly supports, and when Mr. Brillo learned this as a GAL, he did what any GAL would do, and that was went to the to, uh, grandmother, asked if she had any other information to support her claims, and then went to the court saying that the visitation should be terminated because this lady is unstable, and her own admissions in the record prove this. It has nothing to do, you can discard anything Mr. Barilla had to say in this case as a GAL and, and proceed solely on what the grandmother admitted to and what she did and how she tried to undermine the mother in this case and basically did cause the emotional harm that the court found to these children. Uh, visitation should not have been continued, it should not continue, and Mr. Barilla was justified in doing what, what he did. And the fact that they later had a relationship, which there should be a hearing on to establish when this began, has nothing to do with what's pending before the court at this time. I also respectfully suggest that a motion is not a complaint. And it's, there's nothing magical about the fact that the statutes say that a complaint must be filed. Uh, that's the law. And the juvenile courts have limited jurisdiction created by statute. And the statute in this case says that a complaint must be filed by a grandparent before a visitation can occur. And jurisdiction can't be erased, created, or agreed to by the settlement of a case or the parties in any way, shape, or form. And therefore, I respectfully again argue to you that this, the order, in this case, the November of 2011 order and the October of 2016 order are void for lack of jurisdiction and should be vacated by this court and this whole mess should be dismissed. Thank you. Thank you both for the presentation today. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue a written decision which will be mailed to both sides as well as close to our website and to the Supreme Court.